Okay, in today's video lab, we're going to continue in lab seven, part two. So last lab, we finished building out the base component of our trivia game, our quiz game. And so uh, let's run it really quick. So I'm going to be in the director, uh, the main directory quiz game. And just as a reminder of where we last left off, let's go ahead and run our application. I'm going to use Node the node package manager to execute this built-in module as part of the core module of node, which allows us to host a HTTP server right to our local host. And so as long as I'm inside of the bash terminal that includes my index.html, the launch point of my, uh, of my web uh, application, I can go ahead and just run that. Perfect. So now if I navigate to this address, which is localhost at 8080, let me go over here. This is where we last left off. And so we have um, our header here, the, uh, our, con our countdown timer. We had a score that we implemented. We're uh, using a REST API to go ahead and request a, uh, a question with a set of answers. Oh, I ran out of time, so I get the game over. This brings me back to the start menu which is going to ask me another question. I could skip to another question that I might know the answer to, right? This is, and if I don't answer a question within a certain amount of time, I get a game over. If I answer the question right, I will go ahead and get a score. Excellent. Okay, and then now notice right here, there's a slight bug, but I think we'll correct this in the second part where when we restart a new game, our score seems to say uh, carry over from the previous game. But we're going to correct that in part two, because part two, we actually want to implement a leaderboard for this, where when we launch into the game, instead of launching into a question, well, let's see what it's going to look like. Let's look at the mock up here. We're going to want to produce a leaderboard. In order to do this leaderboard, we're going to go ahead and um, we're going to use get request to go ahead and get the state of the leaderboard, but then we're also gonna do put requests. Since we want the leaderboard to be public to every user and have all the same names for every individual user, this means that the leaderboard data can't be stored in the individual client, right? It has to be stored in some publicly available space. So we're gonna use another REST API that, that effectively let us use be used to store JSONs uh, and again, we'll do more things with the DOM and events inside this part two. And this is just a mock-up. So this is what our main uh, game starting board should look like, where it's going to have like the heading uh, HUD with a quiz game and the time and the score. And then we'll see a top set of scores, the top five scores with names and then the score that they achieved. And then we'll have the ability to go ahead and then play and hit that uh, play button that then launches us into a set of questions. Okay, so moving forward with this implementation, we're gonna use a simple and robust JSON storage solution. So there's this service, jsonbin.io, that provides a simple REST interface to store and retrieve JSON data from the cloud. And so this is, a is really designed that their own kind of uh, phraseology for this is it, it's designed to help developers focus more on the app development by taking care of their database infrastructure, but without having to do a lot of database setup stuff. So think of this as a baby database of sorts. So a quick summary, we are, we're gonna use JSON bin to provide a free JSON hosting service for public or private data. Note that any data available from the browser should be public. Right, never use private keys in your browser code because it's always viewable from the browser. You can always like use the inspection tools, the dev tools and see anything that's available there. So if you do have things that are like API keys and they're supposed to be private keys, that's one, one place you're supposed to store that is your server because your server is not viewable. Your server is not a transparent box that can be inspected into. Your server acts kind of like a obfuscated black box 
that you can manage all private data in. So always understand any data that you send into the browser, expect it to be publicly viewable by the entity that you're sending it, anyone who's using the browser at that time. Okay, so a quick overview, if you wanted to see, we can copy this URL, jsonbin.io API reference. Uh, let's take a look at where this brings us. So here we could see, oh, they have a 3.0, they've deprecated version two by February 28th, just recently. So we'll see if that affects us or not. Always nice when they update the APIs. So uh, whenever we go to manage data, we potentially want to use those CRUD operations. And notice they actually order this to spell out CRUD if we take the first letter. The ability to create data, the ability to read pre-existing data, the ability to update pre-existing data, the ability to delete pre-existing data. So these are the general broad operations you do for data persistence. And so here they, they have things on schemas, other APIs they offer. If I go and click on create, for instance, here they'll show me the easy ways, the route, like the root URL, then the route I need to go to and the request type would be a post. They show me the things that I could put in my request header. They show me the different content types. So the content type we used before used a search parameter in lab six, right? When we were sending form data to uh, the Google form to go ahead and be appended, we were able to just put that, encode that into the URL. But in this instance, we're gonna have to exchange data inside of the body of a request object. And the benefit of a request objects when you're using a post or put or create is that it can have a body and just not a header. A header is visible to any entity that that request is passing through. Uh, so it's viewable, but if you have data that you wanna protect, if you wanna hide from, uh, from middle entities, from when you initiate the request until the web server gets the request, you wanna encapsulate that in the body. The body is non-viewable. And so we're gonna treat the data that we're passing along as being effectively private to our application. So we're going to start sending it into the body of the request using a JSON. Again, all of these concepts should get discussed in the associated lecture as well. Okay. So if you wanted to say just the basic API for being able to create or read or update or delete so that you can use this in more meaningful ways for other applications, I link you to the API right here. So Okay, and so let's see here, but effectively you could break the API into two different parts. You're gonna have the bins API, which is going to allow you to create, which you're gonna use a HTTP method of posting to create. You're going to use get to be able to read pre-existing data from the bins, uh, um, the JSON bin uh, API you're going to use a put method to be able to update pre-existing values inside of there. And then we're not going to worry about really deleting. So again, private and public pins, a uh, bins are use this API. So for get and put actions do not require a key. So they're safe to perform in public code. However, post and deletes actions require a key and so it's unsafe to perform in a public code so our code that we're deploying in our browser is public code so we want to avoid putting our api key in there so you're going to notice we're going to focus exclusively on and this is i think this is inside the the um beginning here we're going to exclusively focus on then using the get and put requests because we can do that without issuing an api key which means that we will generate we will create our JSON inside of their web application from the get-go when we log in so that it pre-exists and we'll only ever mutate that one piece of data so we won't ever issue a delete. So notice we won't use any operations that will require the API and that way we don't have to reveal it. 
Okay, in addition to that, we're gonna look at the collections API. So using the collections to create, uh, collections create API, you can create collections to group the records, which later can be fetched using the query builder. Okay, so a quick view. So we should be able to open this in the browser because this is a Git request. Any Git request the browser can even do for us right inside of the viewport when we put the uh, URL in the address bar. So before I look at this, let's take a quick look at this dashboard. So when actually, let me get go to the very beginning of this service. So jsonbin.io. Oh no, not dashboard. I want. So when you first get into here, uh, yeah, you could see since I'm logged in, they have the ability to add to a collection and you could do all this. Typically, let, let me see what it looks like if I go into an incognito window. And let's go to the initial address, jsonbin.io. So I'm already logged in, but if you, you haven't created an account yet, it's gonna give you the option to get started and to be able or to log in if you already have. I think when you go to get started, they give you options so that you can actually log in with a pre-existing account. Uh, I, I log in personally with my GitHub account. So I've authenticated and authorized my GitHub account to go ahead and uh, use it as a validation tool to access a user profile inside of jsonbin.io so I can start generating my own JSONs to store in their service. If, and just so you know, let's take a look at the price and you see there is a free plan and that's exactly the same plan I want. And a free plan, you know, it restricts you to 10,000 requests. We're not building any large scale apps. It's just, you know, for experimental testing portfolio purposes. So this meets our requirement. And, you know, it's, it's pretty bare bones, but it allows us to do exactly what we need to do for low scale projects. But this is not obviously a service you'd wanna use the free plan for, for deployed service. Excellent. Okay, so when I go into my actual dash, you'll see that I have the ability to inspect the bins I've already created. I wanna say, let's see here, looking at the ID number for this, right? Here, it ends in a CO2. So let me go back to my dashboard. So this is the one that we'll be using in the lab, but preferably you will create an account and make your own general bin. I give the, uh, the, uh, the instructions on how to do that inside the lab so that this exists. And then you can go ahead and, and view it. Let me get the link here. I can view it here. Oh, I guess, let me click. Yeah, so I can view the initial content of it here. Now, one interesting thing is every time a put is done to it, every time there's a mutation to the data, it tracks it, it does version control. So there's for, uh, 28 different writes to this bucket that I have at this particular ID. So if I click on that, I could see version one and then version two and then version three. And I can all, go all the way to the most recent version, which is 28 to see the current state which is actually being used by the application. And actually I can also access this by just appending latest. So let me show you, and this is what the link is. So if I go to this URL, this is the endpoint. If I go to this URL and this B for bucket, and then the ID of the bucket I wanna access. And so here, let me get rid of the last. So here, this would give me the first version of the data. But if I want the most, the latest version, I could just do slash latest. And this will give me the latest version, version 28. And if we mutate it again, it will give me version 29. So this is going to be the link we pretty much would want to use to go ahead and read the state of our leaderboard from. And again, if at any time what I'm presenting, you have questions on, just go ahead and drop it in the chat channel and I'll try to address it. But I'm just trying to give you a, a quick uh, intro into the service we'll be using to store our data on a backend service so that we'll be able to get this JSON at any time. So one thing you should look at this JSON is it's actually an array, right? So we have an array. 
Inside the array is a collection of objects, and I actually have five objects, one, two, three, four, five. Each object has two properties, a name property and a score property. And notice they're, they're uh, sorted by scores. The highest score is the uh, at index zero, and the, the lowest score is at index four. Excellent. Okay, so here are going to be the steps to create your own JSON bin. You would create a free account. I would suggest just using your GitHub account. Then you can go to your dash. I just showed you my own personal dashboard. There should be a create new button. Let me see if I can at least show you what that looks like. Let's go to the dashboard. Yeah, right here. They have a create new button where if I'd selected to create new, I could go ahead and add to a collection. I think I have mine defined at the API collection. You have to generate a collection for your data to be a part of, and you'll see here when I did mine, I had it as part of this API collection. And then I can go ahead and uh, enter some valid JSON data Make sure to toggle it to be a public bin. So again, let's go back to my, my dashboard. And right here, you see it has the option to be private or public. You want it to be public, because if it's private, it requires a key. We don't want to use a key. So we want this to be publicly available to from our browser code. Then we would actually select to create and then JSON bin is then posted and they will have an access URL field to get its bin. So here they'll create this URL that you can then use, just like I showed you that has the endpoint using the ID that it's gonna create for you to access that JSON. So this allows us, and again, JSON just stands for JavaScript Object Notation. There's a lecture I talk about it. I think I talk about uh, JSONs inside of the standard object. Uh, I think that's lecture nine, standard objects. You can find a lot more about JSONs and I define JSONs much better though on my series of lectures when I talk and introduce MongoDB. So if you wanna jump forward and just watch a little bit or jump to the points where I talk about JSON in those lectures, you could do that because those are all available to you. Excellent. Okay, so now that we have an understanding of the backend service we're going to use to store our leaderboard and how our leaderboard is effectively just going to be an array of five objects where each object contains a name and a score value, then we can start talking about actually implementing this. So what I'm going to do is for my first goal for building my leaderboard, I want to display a main menu to the DOM. Right now, I don't have a main menu that I go to. So let's build one. So we can eventually put our, our, our board into there. So we're going to define this as an approach, apply, approve uh, set of uh, sequences, our plan, our do, and our test, just like all the other labs. So for our approach in this goal, we're going to define a main menu scene in our view and then render that to the DOM. So we're going to go into our Vue.js and we're going to add an exported function that's gonna render the start men, uh, menu into view. So let's go into Vue.js, go here, let's go here, Vue.js, perfect. And I'm going to add a new function that can be exported, presumably so that it can get imported by app to invoke it whenever the app needs to update the view to be the start menu versus the game over scene or the play scene. So our start menu, maybe I should have called it start scene to be more, uh, more in line with play scene and game over scene. Um, uh, I'll keep it the same so it's in line with what the documentation is. Anyway, so let's see what we're doing here. So this is an in a, uh, exported function. I prefer to use function assignments as opposed to function declarations. I use the fat arrow notations to define my function. My function is going to take that props, uh, a props object. 
So this is just a uh, design pattern you've probably seen. So let me describe this. This is a common design pattern that you'll see in either JavaScript or in Python. So this is a mechanism that gets around the limitation where we don't have the ability to create overloaded methods, where we can create methods with the same name, but different element types uh, or different uh, parameter lengths. So remember what both Python and JavaScript allows us to do is to have default values. So one way to work around that is you define functions that take in a single object because the single object can itself have a variable number of values. That's the advantage of a loosely typed language over a strongly typed language. So whereas in Java, if we were to take in an object, it would have to have an, be a well-defined object. Well, unless it's you know a um, abstract class or it's an interface, in which case you can use the same approach in Java. Uh, the object we can pass in here can have any number of, uh, of uh, properties. And so then we could just dereference the collection of properties any one of these functions need. So here I can have this one attribute, but the first thing I do that's getting passed in as this parameter is I destructure from properties three different values. Now, in reality, the value of properties when I'm using this inside of my app.js file is going to be the state. Remember, I have this state property here, which is just an object that contains all of the states of my application, my web application. So score, timer, interval ID, and trivia are all stateful things that get defined. And again, this is, this is we're using for this application, a functional approach. So functional approaches still have states that it has to manage over just like object oriented approaches. But instead of encapsulating the state across a collection of objects, we encapsulate our state in a data store uh, of sorts, uh, some place where all of our state resides at at one time. So then in actuality, we would pass that as the object into our view where we can then destructure it and then get access to the value of timer, the value of score, and the value of trivia. Now, even though we're destructuring trivia, in this instance, we don't need the question and answer so the only thing we're going to be using is going to be the timer and the score. Notice what we're doing here is once we get access to those properties, we're going to invoke the render DOM method. And this requires a string to get passed into it. So we're going to do a string literal that's going to dereference and invoke the HUD function that we imported from components. And remember, that just is going to print out the first half here, quiz game, time, and score, and then a horizontal and then we'll do a horizontal line. And then we're gonna create a button that says play. And then we'll have an on-click event that will go ahead and um, uh, invoke as a callback function whenever there's a, uh, this button is pressed or clicked on to invoke create game. And this create game, since it will be triggered by the event dispatcher, will have to be registered in the global scope and not the uh, module scope. So this will be registered inside of the window object. Excellent. And so let's save that. So then the next thing that I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to go into my app.js file and actually refactor our start method to set the score to zero. And and have the view rendered to the start menu. We need this score to go to zero because right now we just keep carrying it over each time we start a new game. So that's gonna correct that issue since we intend to have a leaderboard. So let's go to the app and let's go to, um, was it um, our start? Yeah, window start. So let's go into start right now. Start just creates a game. So instead, what we're going to want to do here is we're going to want to set inside our state the score to zero whenever we start the game. We're going to want to set the timer to 20. And we're going to want to go ahead and tell view to invoke that start menu. Now that we have a start menu. Let's uh, have this over. Perfect. And again, we're passing it that state property. Okay, so now that we've done that, 
The third thing we're going to want to do to achieve this goal is we're going to refactor our create game method into being globally scoped so that the event dispatcher may access it. So we already had a create game right here, but right now it's only a module scope. And since I want to be able to invoke this from pressing a button, I'm going to have to now register it as part of the window object. So remember the window object is available to me globally. So I can always register a new property by just doing window.createGame. This is a new property and then I'm doing assignment, which will be this function. And again, this is one reason why I've been preferring doing uh, function assignments as opposed to function declarations. So if for any time I have to change membership of this function, I could just preface whoever owns this function with the dot operator. So there's not a lot of refactoring that has to be done there. And again, uh, another advantage of using uh, function assignments over function declarations is all declared functions are hoisted, whereas um, function assignments are not. And again, hoisting is talked about in, I wanna say the first basic JavaScript lecture that we talked about. Okay, so now that we've updated our, uh, our uh, create game method, we should be able to actually test. And when we go to test this, we're going to use our HTTP server. I still have mine launched. So actually I should be able to leave it launch this entire time in the background and I should be able to refresh my page. And every time I refresh the page, any saved changes to my index.html should then be served into my browser automatically. So I'm gonna just keep the server running in the background. And so let's open the index.html and our game should actually start to a starting menu. So let's see if it does that. So everything looks saved. I don't see any dots. Let me go over here, refresh. And there we go. We now have a starting page that we go to. Quiz game, time 20, score zero. I'm gonna hit play. And play launches my game into what was traditionally just the uh, play scene. So now I starts the timer. It gives me a score zero. Uh, it gives me a category, difficulty, easy. Greenland is almost as big as Africa. True, nope. And so I fail. So let me go to the start menu. And the start menu now brings me to the start like play again, right? So this is all working very beautifully, right? I now have a launch point for my application. And ideally I can put the leaderboard between these two horizontal lines, right? So that whenever we restart to a new game or whenever I initially launched my game, I could see who the top five uh, people who played it were. So the next goal I'm going to have is let's issue a GET request to our web server, to, that, that, to the uh, REST API that's going to allow us to manage our leaderboard data to get the leaderboard data. Now we already have data for a mock leaderboard setup. We should at least have some uh, created our initial data set that for all intents and purposes is this. And I actually give you the ID to this. So while you're building it out, you can test using mine, but I would prefer for you to go through the process and make your own. But if you need to debug at any point, you can use my key as well. Okay. So again, for this goal, for our approach, we're gonna use an HTTP GET request because it does, it, that's, we wanna be able to get the data, but it also doesn't require an API key either to request the web server's REST endpoint to get the leaderboard into the browser. Okay, really jumble words. Use a GET request on the web server's endpoint. Yes, that's what we wanna do. Okay, so in order to do this, we need to initialize some constants for the JSON bin, ID, and the HTTP get endpoints. Again, I like to define these constants because if I have to refactor my code or if I have to ever change any of these because let's say the API uh, changes, I know where to instantly go in the code base to mutate these endpoints or my IDs or anything else that needs to change so that my code is as flexible as possible. That way I don't have to hunt in various functions that rely on this data if it were hard coded. I try not to hard code anything in my functions and use uh, named constants instead to represent that kind of data. It's a good software engineering principle to uh, live and die by. Okay, so let's go into our app. 
and we're going to assign these constants along with the rest of our data. So let's go here into our app. So at the very top here, I already have this one name constant for being able to have the endpoint to get a trivia uh, JSON. So here, in order to get our leaderboard, oh, I don't need the trivia one again. Let me delete that. So here, I'm going to create uh, a constant that's going to represent my bin ID. And so yours should be different than mine. And then here, I'm going to create a get leaderboard URL, which is going to be the string template, right, that we saw before. And the, the part that will be different, that is not hard coded, would be whatever your particular bin ID is. So just to make this as readable as possible using a string template, I can then embed the bin ID value right here. And so that'll be the actual uh, endpoint that I'll have to hit with an HTTP request to be able to get the data I'm, I'm searching for from the uh, web server. Okay, the next thing I wanna do is I'm going to create a local variable inside of my state. So I have some, some new state I wanna manage. It's going to be a collection. So I'm gonna use an array and I'm gonna call this top scores. So let's add this into our state object for our data. So here I'm going to create a comma and add a new key value pair. Top scores will be the key and it'll initially, the state will be a empty array. But when I finish requesting that data, that's where I'm going to store it inside my application. That's the intent of that. Okay. Then the next thing I want to do is I want to refactor the start method inside of my app.js to be able to get the leaderboard data from the server and display it into the console. So let's go ahead and let's go into that start method. That's going to be right here. So now I'm going to go into my state. And I'm going to do an await. And then inside of HTTP, I have this send a get request method that I already made. We already created this. Let's actually take a look at this. So inside this module, I have one method, set, get, set, send a get request. Now notice the beautiful implementation of this function. We didn't hard code it just to get a trivia request when we first made this, we made it very flexible such that we can pass any type of URL. So now that we have a different endpoint, we can use the same function because we created something that was pretty flexible. So we will send it the URL that we want to send the request to, and we're going to do the same thing we would normally do for any GET request. We're going to create a new kind of parameter object that will have the HTTP method we want to use. And since this is defined as sending a GET request, we're going to add that method as a GET. And then we're going to send, we're going to do a fetch to the URL that got passed in with the options object that includes the method type that we want, either GET or PUT or POST or DELETE. And we will await a response object. And recall here, we would then, when we await the response, once we get a response, we will then use a response object of the JSON method on there to pull the JSON data that's embedded into that response and the body of that response. And then when we get that data read into memory, we will then return that back to the invoking function. And so remember, this was an async function. Every async function has to be invoked with the await keyword. And since now we're using await inside this function, it itself also has to be a sync, but it was already a sync. So we don't have to do anything special to add with that. But just keep that in mind. Anytime you have at least one call of await to wait for an asynchronous process, we have to have that function that the await is defined in as a sync itself. So here we're just going to use this method we've already developed last uh, in the previous video, lab video. And we're going to use that new URL endpoint that we just created, that get leaderboard. And so that's going to return to us the data, the JSON data. It's not JSON anymore. It's now in memory JavaScript objects. 
So actually, it's not just an object, though. It's an array that contains five different objects. And I'm going to bind that. I'm going to assign that into the top scores that is inside a state. And then we're just going to console log that just to make sure that I got that data from some backend service into our browser, into our client side of our application. And so once I do that, I should be able to uh, test that out. So let's go ahead and again, we'll launch the HTTP server if it's not already running, but I, I started running it earlier and I haven't killed it yet. So I'll let it to continue to, uh, to run. I'm going to open the index.html file and let's go ahead and inspect inside of our dev tools to see if we get something that's stored inside there now. I'm not going to get what's here. I'll get something now. So I'll get whatever's stored inside of my JSON bin. Now, when you create your own JSON bin, make sure it's mocked up to have the aesthetic of how we intend to have our data model. This is what's called a schema. So you have to, our client, our client logic is going to be biased on having the data inside the JSON be defined in a very particular way. It's going to be biased on having an array, right? Because top scores is. Uh, expecting an array to be there and that array having five objects where each object has a name and score. So when you build out your object in JSON bin, make sure that it is looks just like this, that you adhere to this, your database schema. So again, when you produce your, for your final project, a schema of the data, the persistent data that your app's going to rely on, you have to know for parsing it on either your web server or your web client, what, how it's going to be stored. And you're going to see the importance of that in this lab because your code might not work if you don't store it exactly in this way. The, the, the logic for reading in the top score is dependent on it looking like this. Okay, let's test this out. Should we include no cores mode? Um, that's a good question. I did not, we should, for, for a get request, there's no body that's included, so we shouldn't have an issue with including no cores mode for this. So uh, gets just include the headers typically. So let's actually test this out. Save that. And oh, look at this. Look at in my dev tools, in my contact, uh, in my console log, I have a array of five elements. And if I expand that, I got name A with the score 30, name B with the score 20, name Nick with the score 11, name C uh, with a score of 10, and name D with a score of five. And in fact, if I go and look at the data that's stored on jsonbin.io, I see that that's exactly the case. Perfect. So that's exactly, so I, I'm able, so I successfully was able to request this backend service for this data that I now own and have the ability to mutate. So this will give me data persistence for all of my users who use my application. I can have a shared leaderboard now stored using this service. Very exciting. Okay, so now let's move on to our next goal. Here, I want to display the leaderboard to the DOM. Right now, we're just doing a console log, but let's actually author this. Let's actually write this so that we can see it. So here, our approach is we're going to define a leaderboard component because that's where we're, what we've been doing for everything that's been writing out to our DOM. We, we, any new HTML will be contained inside a, a JavaScript component that represents that HTML that we want to author. So we'll define a new one that's our leaderboard component that returns the HTML to be used by the main menu scene. So this means we have to go into our components and we're going to create a new JS file that's called leaderboard.js. Again, it's convention that all of my components, my HTML components are going to start with an uppercase. And we want that, we're going to want that as, yeah, we're, we're going to want to export that too. So let's go, let's go actually to our terminal here. So I'm in scripts. Let me go into components. Okay, so I'm in the components. If I do ls, I can see I have my HUD component, my options component, my questions component, my skip, and just a readme. So here I'm going to create a leaderboard.js file. 
excellent. So now if I go and inspect the contents of that components, I should have leaderboard created. Let's go ahead and open this into our IDE. And here we will go ahead and encode inside this function the HTML that makes up our leaderboard. So let's see what that's going to be. I'm going to create a uh, function assignment. I'm going to call it leaderboard. I'm going to assign it a function where I can pass in a top scores that uh, array. And I'm using fat arrow notation to define my function, which means I don't have to have a return keyword. But in order to go ahead and ensure it returns the string literal, I encapsulate it inside of parentheses. So if I hadn't articulated why I was doing this before, it gives me a way to uh, easily encapsulate a multi-line uh, fat arrow function, right? Because I'm not using curly braces. So, and if I try to use curly braces, that's actually the syntax I use for object to define an anonymous object. So in order to create a multi-line string to be returned by fat arrow function, I can encapsulate the string in between parentheses. And then the parentheses is kind of serving for me a way of encapsulating the string the same way brackets do for statements of code. It could be these lines on the string. Okay, and then once I do that, I have my HTML, the, a heading element that'll be top scores. Then I'm gonna use a, a section element. Inside of this section will be a ordered list. So it'll give me my numbering for free, the uh, four, one, two, three, four, and five. And then I'm going to go ahead and dereference into their uh, list items. So this is a function. Let, let, let's look at my components. It doesn't exist yet, right? If I look at my components, again, I know that this is supposed to be a HTML component invocation because I'm using that uppercase. So I know that I'm going to invoke list items. I'm going to pass the top scores. And presumably, this will go ahead and return a collection of list items that's been stringified that will then be the children of this ordered list. So if there's five list items that are in one string that gets returned by this function invocation, then they will be numbered by the OL, the, the ordered list parent uh, HTML element. Okay, so now the next thing I wanna do is still inside of leaderboard, I'm going to create that list items function that it relies on. So I can think of this as like a helper component function. Now, this doesn't need to be known outside of the leaderboard JS file itself. And that's why we're just going to export by default the leaderboard. So this will be another HTML component that allows us to break the construction of the HTML element into smaller bits to make it more readable, right? We're using our, our various uh, code strategies, the same kind of methodologies we, des we learned how to define in Java 1 to start breaking down the complexity of our user interfaces so that they're very object-like or very functional-like where we can break it, it down into smaller parts that where one part relies on another. So for instance, with list items, which gets invoked here, we're going to pass top scores. Again, I'm going to use a function assignment, and I'm going to use fat arrow function notation. Here, I'm actually going to define a, uh, a, a, um, a code block. So I'm going to use the uh, curly braces. Now, since I'm using a code block here, I actually have to explicitly have a return type. So I will have a return type of whatever is defined as li here. Uh, the first line of code I'm going to have here is going to be an empty string. And I'm going to use the let because I'm going to change the state of the, the string over the course of this function call. So li represents a, uh, a list items. So this will be the plural. Then what I'm going to do is on top scores, that's an array, all arrays, as you might recall from our data structure le uh, uh, lecture, have a sort method. And the sort method is a higher order function, which means it takes in a function itself 
in order to sort an array, the function it takes, and we're passing in an anonymous function here, is one that defines how the sort occurs. So, and I believe it's in Java 2, you probably learned how to implement uh, uh, sorting logics. And so this works very similar to that. Uh, the way that a sort works is it sorts by evaluating two elements at any given time. So we can just label these elements as A and B. Now, in reality, you can name these parameters anything because they're just parameters, right? They're labels. Anyway, the way that a, the, a sort function has to work, though, is it has to resolve in a negative, a positive, or a zero value. So here, the feature we're going to use to define our sorting is going to be uh, the score. So these are objects we're, we're sorting on. Remember, top scores is an array of objects that have two properties, a name property and a score property. So we are dereference the score property from the second parameter, and we're going to subtract it from the score property from the first parameter. And so we want to sort it in high in, in uh, such that the highest score propagates to the top and the lowest score propagates to the bottom. So we want to subtract the B score from the A score so that the result is if the B score is higher than the A score, right? Then we want the B score to propagate towards B sorted in a higher order. If the A score is higher than the B score, then we want the B object to go to get sorted to the back half of or behind it. And if it's the same, then we don't have to mutate the order at all, really. OK, so this is just so this will produce either a negative, positive, or zero. That is the internal sorting logic we'll then use to arrange the elements. So what we're going to have as scores here, and this is going to be constant, is going to be the, the ordered collection of objects. So then we're going to do a for loop for each row, for essentially each object in scores. What we're going to do is we're going to use that string template to create a list item. And I'm going to dereference from the, each row the name inside that object and the score so that I get a list item that is the name colon score. And I'm going to append that, right? I'm going to concatenate that to the list item. So when I do this the first time, I go from an empty string to having one list item. And then when I do the for loop to move to the second element, I will append a new list item, and then a third, a fourth, and a fifth. So this is going to return a string that will include all five list items back to back, which will then be embedded into this ordered list here. And then that, that ordered list will give it the numbering one, two, three, four, five. OK, excellent. So the next thing I want to do here is I'm going to need to import that leaderboard into our um, into our view so that we can actually use it. So let's make sure that's saved. Let's go to view. Let's go to where we are importing things into view. And we're going to now import that leaderboard from the components directory leaderboard.js. And now the next thing I want to do is I want to refactor my start menu to also include the leaderboard with the top score. And like one of the nice things here is you can see how easy it becomes since we're making everything modular and we're using a very kind of in conceptually uh, an object oriented way, or again, a functional programming way, but you see how functional programming can self organize itself in the same way we kind of consider things to be object like. Uh, so that we do minimal refactorings for our code base. So here, let me go to my start menu. So inside my start menu here, um, probably what I want to do is I'm going to do this right between my HUD and my horizontal rule. So here, the HUD already produces a horizontal rule, if you remember. So here, right underneath there, I'm going to also add the leaderboard and pass a top score. So let me go ahead and get top scores dereferenced from my properties so that I have access to it so I can send that to my leaderboard. And so that's it. After I do that, I should now have implemented enough code such that I can test to see if we get the leaderboard added. 
So let's just refresh our browser window and see if we don't get this here, a set of top scores that have one through five there. So let's save that. Let's go to our browser here that has our local host 8080. I'm gonna do a re refresh and there we go. We see our top scores, A30, A20, NIC11, C10, and D5. I see I'm still printing here in the console too. I can probably remove that. Let me go remove that really quick. Uh, that's gonna be inside of my app. Let's see, console log right here. Uh, no, I can just remove that now. That's not needed. So let's test that. And now, yeah, we don't get that anymore, but we do get it here, which is exactly what we want. So now we get our top scores. Now, the next thing I want to do, now that we can get our top scores, we need also the ability to, well, mutate the top scores. So if we have a player who's playing our trivia game, who's playing our quiz game, and they got a score higher than one of the ones that's uh, inside of our top score list, we're going to want to send a put request to our backend service that will then update our collection of scores to update our leaderboard. So here our approach is we'll use that HTTP put request on the web server's REST endpoint to update the leaderboard data. So here we'll define an exported function inside of our HTTP module, because right now we have the ability to send get requests, but this is the first time we're gonna be defining a put request. So let's go and create a method, a helper method inside that module that will allow us to start sending out put requests. So let's go here into our HTTP module and we're gonna create an exported function. So here I'm going to, again, use a object um, uh, assignment. So it allows me to export this because this will produce it. it. This will essentially save this as a function object. And I will call this it put requests. Here, it has to be asynchronous because we're gonna be using the fetch method on there. And since fetch is an asynchronous method that requires a wait, then the method it's calling that fetch for also has to be asynchronous. Here, in order to put data, we not only need the URL, but we need to get past the data that we wanna to send to our web server so that it can go ahead and, and use that to store. So I'm gonna use the fat arrow notation. However, I'm going to go ahead and use curly braces to find my code block. So I'm gonna be explicit about the return type here. I'll use the actual return keyword. Okay, so I'm gonna do the similar thing to what I did with my, get with my send get request function. I'm gonna create a empty object that will hold the options for this request. And then one thing I definitely always have to define as one of these uh, options is going to be what type of method is this HTTP request. Here, I'm going to define this as a put request, a put method request. Here also, I have to define how is the content type going to be uh, encoded inside of the body of this request. So since this is a put request, put request and post request both have bodies that they can have. So here I want to go ahead and say what the content type of the body will be. It's gonna be a JSON application slash JSON will allow me to embed JSON data. And so the advantage about using the body over the header is recall when we were using contact forms, we encoded all of the data we sent to our contact form as a search parameter. And that made it public. It was viewable to everything from the client to the server and every link in between. If we want the data to be private, to be hidden until it hits the back, to, to until it hits your web server, then you want to encapsulate that data in the body because the body is not readable in route until it hits the web server. But the moment you do that, you have to define what the content type is. And typically we're gonna use JSONs as our content type. The next thing we wanna do is we then have to define a body 
that we're going to add into our request. So we'll create a body property and the body property has to encode, it has to stringify the data. So recall we have json.stringify. So to give you an idea of what this looks like, uh, let's go here. This is a, this I was covered. No, I'm already, this is covered already inside the standard objects lecture. We have this JSON. I can have the option to stringify any type of data. And here I could say, for instance, let's actually get an object. Let's, let's get something that looks like top scores. Uh, so say we have top, it's going to be top scores. And let's say top scores is going to be an array of four objects where each object has a name. And a score. And actually, let me copy this so I can just paste and paste and paste and paste again. Perfect. So imagine this is what my top scores look like. And actually, let me give a different name. Let's save that. Okay. So in memory, I now have top scores. Now, if I want to send this in the body of a request, I can't add something that's just in memory. I have to serialize it. And I have to serialize it as a JSON, which is a string, a human readable string that contains this data. So one, I have a object built in called JSON inside of my browser that has parse and stringify. Stringify allows me to be able to pass in this data and look at what it does here. It goes ahead and converts it into a string, into a JSON string. And actually, if I take the result of this, let's call this my scores JSON. If I was to take this and receive this inside my browser, right? JSON uh, score, JSON, right? That's a string. I could actually use JSON.parse and then give it this string and it's gonna parse it back into a in-memory JavaScript object. So notice it parsed it into an array that actually contains objects that I can then index and get values of score that are numbers and uh, strings that are the properties for names. So this is a very useful built-in library for effectively allowing us to serialize data so that we can either add it into local storage. Another one is local storage. So if you wanna save data locally on a client, you can set item, right? Where we could set the item, let's call this our app data as the string. And then as the value, I can give it the scores JSON, right? So now if I looked, if I wanted to get back something from lo local stores, if I want to get an item, I can give it back that string, look at app data, and it can return that back. And then when I get that back, I can use uh, json.parse and then rebuild that. So if you want to store data on the client side, you can use local storage with set item and get item method. Set item requires a key value pair. Get item just requires the key. The cool thing about that is whenever you refresh the page, you can get the data from a prior session. However, we're doing something different here. We're just wanting to send it to a backend server so that we can get the same scores on all the peoples. But I figured this would be a good opportunity to talk about local storage anyway. Let's clear this out. Okay, so that's what's happening uh, there with the JSON.stringify. And then once we've uh, essentially encoded our data as a string, we can then go ahead and call our fetch to the URL along with the options where we have the body and the headers and the method type. And then we'll get back that response. And now the response here 
is going to be just a response object. There's no data for us to get back because we're telling it, we're giving it a command to put data in. So we only want to change the data. We're not getting anything back. So we're just going to get a response object. So we don't have to do the dot JSON like we did with a get. Because you could think of this more as like a setter method as opposed to a getter method. So then we'll just return whatever the response object is. Okay. So the next thing we need to do now that we have the ability to send a put request is to find an endpoint here. So let's go into our API and we will go ahead and set a put leaderboard. So that's going to go to our api.jsonbin.io to our bucket at that bin ID. So we're sending that our fetch there. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to make a test function. We're going to make a global function test. We're going to put this in app. We're going to delete this function after testing. So here we're going to do window.test put. And the, the reason why we want to do this is we want to test to make sure we can mutate the state before we actually start adding the logic to mutate the state. We want to, we want to force a mutation. So we're going to create a method. Let's go into app, and then we'll talk about what it's doing. So here, we will remove this after this step. In the global namespace and window, we're going to create a method that's called test put. We're going to put in the global space so we have access to it from our dev tools. It's going to be asynchronous, so we'll have to invoke it with the await because it Again, we're going to be issuing the send put request. Here, we're going to create some mock data, right? So an array that has names A, B, C, D, E, and then a set of scores. And then we're going to test our send put request to see and verify that this actually works. So we'll await for HTTP send put, put, uh, put request, and we're going to go to this endpoint, and we're going to send this data, right? The two parameters that that new method requires. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to launch our HTTP server. I already have mine running, and we're actually going to issue that command in our dev tool. And we're going to see if our browser viewport doesn't update. So let's go here. Let's. So right now I have Nick in there. The rest of this kind of looks the same. But uh, actually, just for testing purposes, since I already have a lot of these, Let's change this to like 300, 200, 150. And let's, let's change this to test A, test B, test C, test D, test D. Okay, let's refresh my page. Okay, now I should be able to access this test put so let me do await test put. And let me see if I do a refresh. And yep, once I refresh my browser, I can see that the put was successful. When I invoke that method from my client side, it successfully requests it the backend service to update the JSON with a new set of names and scores. And actually, let's go back and get it back to the original state oh, that I had. So let's go refresh this. Oh, do that. I got the return refresh here. And OK, perfect. And then I've updated it back. And now I'm going to delete this. I just did that to make sure that my put our request would successfully succeed. So after I verified, remember, get rid of that. Otherwise, every time you start your game, it's going to overwrite everyone's top score. That is not what you want to happen. And then what we want to do after this, our, our next goal, and I believe our last goal, is to go ahead and be able to get the name and update leaderboard. And to, we want to get the name of the current player and then update the leaderboard with that name and the score. 
So when a player score is in the top five, then the game should prompt them for a, a name and update the leaderboard. So the first thing we want to do is we want to go into our app and we want a function that adds a new score to the top current five scores and remove the lowest. So let's go into the app JS and define a way to do that. So I'm already in app, so I'm going to define that right here. So here I'm going to create a, a function. Again, I try to always create my functions as constants so they can't be overridden. I, I typically prefer to use the function uh, assignment operation. This is going to have to be a, a synchronous function because we're going to rely on a wait method to be able to get the top score to compare to see if the current player's score beat it. So, and the reason why I want to do this whenever the player stops stops the game is this top scores could have potentially changed from when they first started the game. So every time, this is a good rule of thumb, every time you're about to mutate some remote data, verify that the data that you want to mutate, that you have the current state of it. Now, typically, this logic will be done on the backend service to ensure that, you know, it's going to be accurate, but we don't have a real backend service, right? We're kind of just connecting a front end to something that's managing backend data. So we're going to evaluate whether we should mutate the top score or whatnot on the browser side. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the top five. I'm going to pass in the new score. That's the score that, that's, that's going to have just been had from this uh, player. I'm going to get the current top score now from the remote service. So I'm going to go to HTTP and get, send a get uh, request to that endpoint. That's going to give me the top five. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to push the new score onto the top five. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to um, I'm going to resort the top five such that the highest score propagates to the top and the lowest score goes to the bottom. And then I'm going to do a pop. And so remember what a pop's going to do for me is it's going to then remove the uh, the the lowest score. The So this, whole, this is a, a logic that will ensure that the sorting scores at the lowest one will always get removed. And I'll, then I'll return the state of top five here. So that'll get the new top five effectively. And then the next thing I want to do is I want to create a global function, again, so that the event dispatcher can handle this, that will update the, late, uh, the leaderboard on the web server. And this will also be defined inside of the app.js. So here, I'm going to assign this method into the window object so that the, lead, the event dispatcher will have access to it on like a button press. This will be called update leaderboard. It'll also be an asynchronous method. I use the fat arrow function and I'm gonna use a code block. So I'm gonna use curly braces and I don't necessarily need any return type for this. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grab an HTML element that's going to be in my DOM that has the name ID, and I'm going to grab the value of that. Presumably, that's where I'm going to have the user's name at. This doesn't exist yet, so I'm going to have to do that in the next, the next step. So once I have the user's name, I'm going to create an object that's going to set as the key the name that we just got from an a input, from an HTML input from the user. And then as the score key, the value of the score, I'm going to grab from my app state inside the state object, the score, and I'm going to set that as my current score. Then I'm going to call that get top five method, that asynchronous method here, and I'm going to pass it the current score, which is that object that has that name score set uh, the, or keys, the name and the, uh, the score is keys. And then this is going to return back to me the top five, right? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to then send a put request to the put endpoint with that top five. Now, I'm going to do this regardless, right? So, so if for some reason their top score 
fell off, I'm updating it with the same state it was before. Or if their name was one of the top five, then it's going to update that, right? So notice I'm doing this put request regardless. So I might be putting the same top, uh, top five, or maybe I'm doing a mutated state. I don't really care. And then after that, I'm going to invoke the start method again that's going to relaunch my start menu that has the HUD and the leaderboard, the new state of the leaderboard, and a start button. Then the next thing I'm going to do is we need to create a component inside of our components that's going to be a leader menu, which is going to request, it's going to have that input for a name and it's going to have a button to submit. So let's save that and let's actually go and create, what did I call it, this component, a leader menu. And here we go here, let's pull that into here. And so my leader menu, again, is gonna be a function and by uh, convention, I will use uppercase. I'm going to use a function assignment. I'm using that arrow notation and so that I get an implicit return statement. I'm going to use a, a set, I'm, I'm just going to return back a string, but since I want this to be a string that exists on multiple lines, I have to encapsulate it inside of a parentheses, just so the parser knows that it can, it, it, it includes everything until the end parentheses. So that allows me to make this more readable looking string. And so the string is just gonna return a div, inside the div is gonna say high score. So presumably it should only show this leader menu whenever the user got a high score based off of the previous top high score that it knows. Then we're gonna use a section element where we're gonna embed an input with an ID of name. Remember, this is the thing we're gonna get the value of. The type, type, the type is gonna be text and we're gonna have placeholder in there that's gonna say your name. And then we're gonna have another input, which is gonna be a type button and it'll have a value of a submit. So this will be a submit button, which will then have an on click. Well, it's, it doesn't do a submit event though. It, it has an on click event. So on the event that we click on it, it's gonna invoke the update leaderboard method, which is this method here. That's why we, reg we registered with the window global object. And so the, the label inside the button will say submit. That's what the value there is. So this isn't a submit event, it's a click event that's gonna invoke the update leaderboard inside of our Windows uh, object. And then we'll have a horizontal rule under that and we'll export the leader menu so that it can actually get displayed. So we need to actually import that into our view so we can actually use it. So let's go into our Vue.js here. Let's import the leader menu from our components. Now, the next thing I wanna do is inside of my view, I want to make a quick decision. So I'm gonna create just this method inside of view, a helper method that's gonna to, going to be called is top five. We're gonna pass in a score and the current top five. And we're gonna see if inside of top five, if there is some, so this is checking the existence. Remember we looked at some or any as existential uh, or, or existence-based uh, lookups on data structures. So this allows us to pass a higher order function. So for each item in the top five, if there exists one that has a score that's less than the score that uh, the current score that is part of this game, if at least one of these is true, because this returns back a true or false statement. So if this is true for at least one case, then the entire statement will return true. So we can use this to determine if this score beats at least one of the top five scores. Then I will go ahead and add this invocation in here. So let me go into my game over scene. And underneath the HUD, but before game over, I'm going to do this invocation. It's going to be, I'm gonna pass is top five, right? 
And so is top five requires a score and a top five. So I'm going to go ahead and put score and top five. So this is going to return back something that's true or false. So I'm going to use a ternary operator, right? That's the one that has a question mark and a colon. So if this returns true, I'm going to go ahead and add the component of leaderboard. And if this returns false, then I'm going to add an empty string because then we're not going to bother requesting for a name and telling them they got a high score. So we'll only print the high score in between programmatically in between the HUD and the game over message if it's true that they got a top score. So th again, this is a beautiful thing about using components. I can start making selection statements or repetition statements that allow me to modify my DOM. And then the, the last thing I'm going to do is I can test this out. So that's the last piece of code here. Let's launch our HTTP server if we haven't already. And then using our browser, we can refresh here and let's play the game. So I have currently E has zero points. Let's see, let's, let's skip. So let's first see if we don't get any ability. So let's wait for this to you know, lose with no points. And then we'll see if we don't also have the opportunity to update. So here we ran out of time. Top scores is not defined. Okay. View 22. Let me go to view 22. Um, top wait. Let me go. Let me make sure that view 22. And this is why we test things out. Uh, we have to, inside of Game Over Scene, if I'm going to try to pass in top, top scores, I need to go ahead and actually dereference top scores. So this is absolutely why we test things out. I had actually missed a line of code in this end stage. So let's make sure that I'm actually dereferencing that so it exists when I do this. And let's refresh the page and see if it doesn't work again. So here, let me just... Okay, so that was game over. So I got a game over and notice I did not get a request to get a leaderboard menu. So now let's play again and see if I can't get one right. Harvard University is located in which city? Um, is it in Providence? Nope. I have, <laughs> let's see here, skip. Let's get, a bear does not defecate during, I, no, I'm sure that's false. Oh wait, a bear doesn't defecate during. I'm clearly awful at trivia. <laughs> okay, who is Sonic's uh, tails, right? Ah, okay. So now let's see if when I lose, okay, let me lose. Oh, I actually got that one right. Um, uh, oh wow, I'm getting, oh. Okay, there we go. So now since I had a top score of 52, now, since it's true I was higher than one of the scores, it's going to then invoke that component, add in the high score. I should be able to add in my name, right? And submit that. And when I submit, notice when it then revokes, uh, invokes the start, it now shows that Ted is 52. And in fact, I double submit it. And so notice this could be a slight issue with managing things from client side instead of back ser uh, services. Since I was able to hit the button twice before it updated, it gave me the top score twice. Oops. Which if I want to protect all against that, I would add more logic, but I don't want to do that. This is a, a relatively simple application to give you a proof of concept of this. Excellent. So we are done with this lab now. Um, and we've learned a lot. So just some quick concluding notes here. We learned a little bit about REST clients and modules. We designed a browser application that uses web servers to generate questions and store the top scores for the leaderboard. The browser code was organized into modules, which improves our readability, maintainability, and browsability. There's no more spaghetti code in the HTML imports like what we had before. So clearly further improvements. I would want to handle my leaderboard put request from the server to be safer. We already saw how it's not safe, how I accidentally overrode and got the first two top scores by accident, right? So clearly that's not ideal, but it's good enough for what we want right now. But this is definitely a way we could improve it. Also, I might have some encoding issues that I need to correct, uh, incorrect uh, evaluations 
if the solution uses quotations. So these are for questions. My, my questions, if there's a quotation, it might not print out very well. So I could probably make that a little bit better. Excellent. Is there any questions anyone has about this lab? Well, then we are done with today's lecture then. Let me end this recording.